So one of the things that you were asked to prove on this group assignment uh, is that if I have a sequence that I already know is convergent, in other words, if, it already, if we already know that it has a limit, and in the example of the sequence that's sketched up here, that limit is zero, right? Um, then, and the direction you were working on, is that you also established that the limb soup, the limit superior of the sequence, is also equal to that same value, L in this case. Um, but as some of you noticed, there's a result in our book that's really powerful um, that not only gets at this, but it also gets at another piece. Right? And it tells us that if my limb, if my other of my one-sided versions of these limits, if my limb is also equal to that same value, and in particular, that would mean my limb inf and my limb sup are equal to one another. If they're equal to one another, then it also turns out that it goes the other way. That having a limb inf equal to a limb sup uh, implies that our whole sequence is convergent. So we might say convergent if and only if the limb inf and limb sup are equal. So in fact, both of those two things are true. Uh, and you were only proving on the group assignment kind of one half of the forward direction. That if we already assume that our sequence is convergent, then we can prove that its limb soup is equal to its limit. Um, but in fact, a whole lot more is true, uh, as this theorem shows. Um, and my advice to you and your teams was that by the time you make this first assumption, the assumption of convergence, that's a really strong assumption. Right? That shows us that, as uh, Danielle was saying in her group, that shows us that this sequence eventually enters this orange tube, right? No matter what epsilon that I choose, it enters this little epsilon tube, and it never leaves it eventually after some n. But once you write down that definition alongside the definition of limb soup, you find out that really, as we've been saying, limb soup is just the statement that eventually it becomes upper bounded by this tube, even though it need not be lower bounded by this tube. But entering the tube for the rest of time implies being upper bounded by the top of that tube for the rest of time. And that's kind of the key insight to structuring why this proof, why this result should make sense, the result that you're proving. Right? Um, and I think the tricky part of actually writing that proof is getting that intuition, getting that idea onto a page from the definitions and using the notation of our course. Um, that might be the challenge. So as you're finishing this write up between now and Friday, um, that I think is, is where you're going to be spending your time.